Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast that will help you better understand how to make money in the stock market. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. And we are yet again blessed with the presence of our resident vulture, aka Mr. Not Advice, at Mr. Not Advice on X and Mr. Not Advice uh, com on the interwebs. So, where we last left off, uh, and mind you, this is, uh, we're recording this on January 15th. Where we last uh, left off, Mr. Not Advice took us through some pretty scary scenarios in which what he's seeing based on some real data, the stock market has the potential of really dropping significantly if any of these dominoes play out in the real world. And the first one we talked about was commercial real estate values imploding thereby affecting the balance sheets of regional banks enough so that uh, a major stimulus is needed or there's some severe economic crisis that unfolds which obviously uh, impacts the equities markets. And the second doomsday scenario was what, Badger? Uh, Japan going full Kaizen, essentially turning a bit inward looking after their own currency and their own economy. And as a result, so like withdrawing a whole ton of demand for US treasuries, which is going to cause potentially big problems for the US because Japan is the biggest overseas holder of treasuries. Before we get into the next set of dooms, though, I wonder if I could ask a sort of broader question, Mr. Not Advice. So, you know, here we are recording this in 2023, 2024. If we'd been having this same conversation, it's twenty-four, Badger. It's it's twenty-four. Twenty-three yeah, but, already happened. But Mr. No, Mr. Not Advice had this same view a few months ago too, right? This isn't suddenly woken up in January with a New Year's resolution to see the world going going to shit in a hand bucket. So, if we'd been having this conversation ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, do you think do you think there always would be a list of seven or more dooms, things to be terrified about? Um, or is this, do you feel this is like a unique moment in history, which is much worse than we've had maybe in our lifetimes? Uh, great question. Uh, no, I, 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 there would not be a list that's seven doom items long. There may be one or two. Um, so not seven and not seven items. What I would say six items that have a high probability I mean, greater than 50%. Um, I have never in 30 years as a professional. Uh, having gone through, you know, Orange County being the first county to go bankrupt, and that sent a shockwave through municipal bond market. The the ISP and internet boom and collapse. The year two thousand issue two thousand and one, two thousand and eight. Uh, the the Asian flu crisis. I have never seen this many negative possible data points or negative possible um, catalysts occur at the same time. To the, to the level of seriousness that they could negatively affect, uh, affect the market and our pockets. I've never seen this collection before, not this big. In fact, such a great question. Uh, do you, so forgive my ignorance, but when I take my uh, time machine back to, I wanna say August of September in uh, 2008, I was an investor but I did not hear about the serious troubles until, I mean, I really can't remember. I think it was late August. I, I don't know. It was like the, when it was already too late, so to speak. Right. Uh, and of course, I wasn't as sophisticated in my understanding uh, 14 years ago as I am relatively speaking now. But I, I'm pointing that out because back then, I guess I suppose you didn't know or, or let me rephrase this. Was there a way of knowing how bad things were back then outside of, say, you know, some of the characters featured in The Big Short, the Mike, Dr. Burry, Michael Burry, who, you know, as an autistic savant of sorts, you know, was looking deep inside the numbers and discovered what most people didn't, couldn't otherwise know. Is this a, is this a, 
to what to what extent are the two time frames similar, two thousand and eight and now? I think the, I think to the extent that there are serious catalysts out there um, that are outside of perhaps what a person finds generally uh, finds easily acceptable intellectually. I think that's similar, but I don't think look. If you think of what what caused 2008, an extension of irresponsible credit, irresponsible credit, right? Um, due to way way back the Glass-Steagall Act being removed and letting banks do risk investments. You know, before that, banks could only do their standard banking business. They couldn't go out and buy high-tech startups. They couldn't do the, those types of things, right? So that was the first thing that was a once, uh, first time ever. That created 2008, okay? But what we have today is they never fixed the problems of 2008. They never fixed the, the irresponsible lending. They never fixed the, the moral hazard of being able to borrow money at 0%. From the federal government and then lend it out. I mean, if you can borrow money at zero percent, you're probably going to go out there and invest in whatever you want. Especially if you know that that if you lose, you'll get bailed out. That, in the simplest terms, is where the banks are right now. They 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 believe and they know that hey, it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter how bad our investments are, we'll get bailed out. We'll still have jobs. We'll just pass it along to the taxpayer. But the size at which the problem is today is never been seen in history, ever. And the culmination or the, the aggregate, the fact that so many different geopolitical risks on top of economic risks are happening at the same time, I've never seen it before. And was there anything in 2008? No. No, because remember what's going on has as much to do in that that gray hidden market of derivatives and uh, finance, commercial lending, which are not readily publicly available until it's too late, you know? Um, so that's why I think, you know, you've got this perfect storm of easy money for a decade and a half. You've got consumers that are hooked on easy money, right? Credit, the consumers are just as bad as the banks. They're going out, consumers, is, they're expanding their balance sheets. Okay, historically, so you have this mentality that exists is completely irresponsible. You do not spend more money than you have. But what's worse is you don't hypothecate it. You don't borrow and borrow and borrow and borrow on the same dollar. And that's what's gone on through our entire economic system. So, so, so correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Not Advice. I think Badger's question which I'm really sympathetic to as a long, as historically a long-term investor, having been in the market over 20 years, I know the doomsday stuff. If you, if you put your ear looking for doomsday stuff, you're going to hear it, sure. right? They're all, the fear mongers are out there all the fucking time. And it's attractive to human nature because, you know, as animals, uh, in the jungle, there are lots of tigers and uh, things that will, you know, eat you. And so, <clears throat> but interestingly, I have never, in a sense, succumbed. I don't know if that's correct, but I have never really succumbed to the fear uh, because, I don't know, because I always um, figured, yeah, invest in great businesses hold them it can't be that bad and even if things are bad they're going to recover unless civilization ends right whereas what i believe i hear you saying now and correct me to the extent that i'm wrong you're saying that what's different now that there is first of all there is something different now and what's in part different is not only are there seven or six or however many real high probability things happening but they're happening simultaneously mm -hmm. and that they're to some large extent visible, that yes. they're not accessible only to the Dr. Burry's of right. the world looking at some hidden file. Is that yes. roughly? Yeah, I, I think that because of 2008, people are much more, are much, they're, they're better versed on, on 
you know, they know what derivatives are. They, they, you know, they have a general understanding of the, of, of lending and as especially has to do with residential mortgages and the risk on giving bad credit quality people loans. But I don't think the American public has any idea of what's going on with the commercial real estate market. Generally, I think the American public, a lot of people I talk to say, well, they fixed that in 2008. That was fixed. That's why we propped up the banks. And they didn't fix it, right? Um, I mean, what, did, did anybody see anything in the newspaper that said, 2008, uh, they didn't fix their problems? You know, that's not the mainstream press, you know, the message they put out there. It's sort of ignore it. The problems in 2008 still exist, and they've only been made worse through time. Um, and, and, and again, I'm not generally a pessimist. I don't think you can be an investor and a capitalist and be a pessimist, right? You're naturally an investor, you're looking for growth. You're naturally a capitalist, you're looking for more productivity, more growth in the economy, right? And so uh, this is not natural to me. Um, I'm very hesitant when I talk about downside risks because I've, I want to be very careful that I'm not drinking the sky is falling Kool-Aid. And I've done a very good job over that, uh, of that over the last 30 years. Um, but I also know when risks are high, let's just look at it from that standpoint. Right now, risks are, ex are a record level high for outlier, for some, some event to occur that will affect the market negatively. And yet I only have one outlook where the market goes up organically because of growth. And that's stimulus. I don't see any other way that this market continues higher. Um, other than stimulus, it, the economy's not growing, companies are laying off. You know, it's not like we're in a global growth environment right now. And the previous growth environment they were in was fake because it was caused by stimulus. And so this is worse than it was in 2008, unfortunately. Well, that's, that's probably a great opportunity to now start drilling into some of the other dooms because I guess these are the other additive risks in your calculation of uh, how the sky is falling. Do you, want to, do you want to pick us up with your, your next most likely doom? Yeah, unfortunately, it's already happened with the Gaza expansion. Um, you know, the, the bombing into Yemen, uh, uh, the massing of Israeli forces on the northern part of Gaza. When I talk about expansion, I'm looking at primarily tier one countries. So tier one countries to me are Japan, Russia, China, the United States, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Uh, tier two com countries are Lebanon, um, to some extent, Gaza's, I mean, it's not fully recognized. Um, and so what I'm thinking is in Saudi Arabia allowed, they provided operational assistance for the recent Yemen bombings is when you have, when you start drawing in uh, tier one countries, such as Saudi Arabia or Iraq, um, that's what I'm very concerned about. Um, Again, it has to do with an escalation of capability, too. Uh, Saudis don't have nuclear weapons, but right now, um, what we're finding, what we're seeing is this is a proxy war between Iran and the U.S. And if Iran decides to directly bomb or hurt U.S. servicemen, or if the U.S. decides that, then that's your expand, full expansion. Uh, and that would be negative to the market, probably for 5 to 10%. Um, but... And, and the geopolitical risk goes up. Look, if Iran and the U.S. face off directly on a battlefield, Iran, where did they buy their weapons from? Russia, okay? The last thing we want is Russia and U.S. or Russia and NATO facing off. But we're, here's what's happening. The, the, it's ratcheting up, right? What was Israel-Gaza, then it expanded. And if we continue this expansion, uh, right now what do we have? Eight countries involved, directly involved. Um, I don't know what the benchmark is for a, a regional conflict or a world war, but the less parties involved, the better. And we don't want to have tier one countries directly involved facing each other on the battlefield. And of course, there's the backdrop. This is all taking place in the backdrop of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Yes. Or rather, Russia versus the West, right. aka NATO. So that certainly doesn't help because, of course, there are political implications toward the U.S. continuing or not continuing to fund Ukraine. 
So yeah, it is complicated. Though I, I do want to check something with you, Mr. Not Advice. This is almost pains me to say this because it feels so immoral or maybe even, you know, cold blooded. But historically, war has often been used as a stimulus to the economy. I mean, I don't know, right? I don't know if the analog is, obviously the analogs are way more complicated, but you know, the US was in the Great Depression. What, what got it out of it was World War II. So, but your, your uh, view and why you're placing the expansion uh, of geopolitical risk in Gaza as a market uh, negative is, is what? How do you figure that? Uh, because of the proxy designation that the battle is truly a, a proxy war between the U.S. and Russia slash Iran. And I think that there is a line in the sand that must not be crossed, which is direct attacks on U.S. military, sol uh, on people, on U.S. soldiers versus direct attack, let's call them government representatives. So a direct attack on a U.S. government representative versus a direct attack. Now, we already saw that over the weekend with the U.S. embassy in Iraq being bombed. But, but, but again, it, it's going to have to be from Iran to the U.S. or U.S. to Iran. Um, yeah, war is generally good for the market uh, after the initial fighting begins because of the capital spending that goes on to fund the war and to, to, to conduct the war, all the way down from commodities, right, metals, and all the way up to the production. Those companies will do well. Christoph, you've hedged your portfolio against an explosion of CRE. Have you hedged your portfolio against an expansion of some of these conflicts in any way? No, because I think, uh, I mean, I still, you know, my deep in my bones, I'm a long-term buy and hold investor who thinks the simplest, if I, if I may call it that, the simplest way to, to gaining wealth is you find the best businesses and you you essentially let them do the, their thing. So I try to make it more complicated than my simple pea brain can handle. And I think with the KRE position, I understand that almost directly. I mean, it, it's, it's a, to me, straight line from here's what the numbers say, here's what I could see with my own two eyes. I could see probabilistically that playing out um, I don't know, po you know, to use a poker analogy with the probability of a hand of jacks at the table. Whereas once we get into, I guess, things that I feel are completely out of anybody's control in a complex system, and you have, you know, comp chaos theory, and you just do not, you cannot know what this little action over here, how that's going to play out over there, I start thinking, I can't, make any reasonable bets on anything like that and maybe mr not, not advice you have a way of you know pointing us to exactly maybe some of the things you were talking about like maybe commodities in a certain way could be a good investment but um i, I just feel like it's in a way too hard pile at this moment yeah i think there's i think that uh, you know i agree with you because Think about the analogy, if I take a stick of, half a stick of dynamite and throw it into a house, we know it's going to be bad. We just don't know which walls it's going to blow out, right? And so trying to hedge against this, first of all, you know, you all know that I'm a timing person. There's a right time, you know? I, I don't think we're at the right time yet, because there, there's always an opportunity to look at what the current data set is and react to it. The problem is on these types of events, most people ignore them. So, you know, I don't know how this particular stick of dynamite is going to blow out the building, but I know it's bad. And it's, it's particularly bad because I've got five or six other things that I think could happen too, perhaps at the same time. I don't think the entire list gets done this year, but I, I again, I speak to I've never been in a market environment with this many risks being this ignored. I mean, the VIX is trading at what, 12, 13, right? I, and, I mean- Yeah, and what that means, uh, what that means is <clears throat> uh, the VIX is a, call it level of um, risk. And when it's low or lower, and that's a relative number, but I, I, I would consider anything below 20 as the market saying, Things are pretty steady. Mm -hmm. 
and we're at 12 right now. So this is what's the interesting, this is maybe, Badger, for me, the, the hardest thing about talking to Mr. Not Advice and, you know, um, thinking through these doomsday scenarios is there's this level of almost like psych, uh, mental dissonance, psychological dissonance, where the, these doomsday scenarios do make sense to me and simultaneously the market is saying everything is not only fine but like <laughs> there's not even like like at 12 it's like it's it's more steady and calm than it's been in i don't know how long so how do you how do you square these two uh, seemingly completely opposite views i, I don't know what's your, your yeah, you, it, you're a great uh, test case here, Badger. Like, how hearing these these things, how do you make, what do you make of this personally? Because volatility creates opportunities for for all kinds of investors, whether you're a long term or a short term investor. And if the market bombs, you know, I've got some cash on the sidelines. I've got ready to put into play. You guys who are using derivatives and you're um, you know buying calls as well as puts, you can make money on the way down in a different way. So. Uh, it's not necessarily doomed for our portfolios. And then the other thing to think about is, like as we start talking about some of these kind of war topics, maybe to build on Mr. Not Advice's uh, analogy of chucking like a stick of dynamite into a house, don't know which wall it's going to blow up. Well, like there's an extreme of some of these scenarios where you're not chucking a stick of dynamite into the house. You're throwing like a whole like case of TNT in and the whole house is gone, right? And and maybe like the next door neighbor's houses too. So you know, if if geopolitical contact conflict kind of spills over into like a real World War Three, none of this stuff is irrelevant, right? Our portfolios are the last things we'll be worried about. Um, so you can only you can only sort of worry and hedge so much. Um, but I'm kind of I'm I think I said it about six months ago. I'm kind of doing what I've always done personally, which is just kind of buy the best quality companies and just steal myself emotionally for a 40, 50% drawdown. If it happens, it happens. I've got enough money on the sidelines to pay the bills. Kind of not sure what else I can do as a long-term investor. Well, <clears throat> I don't know if that's a natural, uh, if that's a natural uh, point to move on to one more doomsday scenario or Mr. Not Advice, do you wanna, do you wanna offer your perspective on what else is potentially available for us, for any investor in this particular moment? I think, you know, I think a lot of people when they invest, they only look at one side, how much money they can make. If you ask the average investor, well, how much money could you lose? They, a lot of times, haven't even given that any thought. So I think the very fact that your listeners are cognizant that there are events out there going on that could detrimentally affect their portfolios and to psychologically and emotionally accept that, that that's going to dispel bad habits, okay? One of them being reacting out of emotion, fear. So I, I think that, you know, long-term investing, um, you know, I'm always of the opinion that no matter which direction you think the market is going into, you need to have a plan ready for when it goes in the opposite direction. And cash is a position. Why anybody at this point wouldn't be in, you know, Badger, you said, you, know, you, you have cash. You know, I, you know, if I was still managing a standard portfolio, I'd be telling people, raise cash, raise cash. You know, this is the time to do that. You know, maybe if you've got $100 on the market and you sell 25% of it at these highs, so what if the market rips another 5 to 10% higher? Who cares? Yep. The first rule of investing, my rule is protect capital, though. But too many people don't look at that. And they're not, they don't want to, you know, people will risk losing 50% to, for the hope of capturing an additional 5 or 6%. That is a terrible risk to reward, right? So cash is an investment. And so, and oddly enough, not oddly, but there's two other safety trades, um, Bitcoin and gold. I mean, if you, you want to look at things that are, you know, that right now Bitcoin's trading as a safe as a safety trade. That's what we're seeing. It's trading like a safety trade. So 
there are things nobody wants to do. It, it's you know you have a hundred bucks in the market and the market's where it at where it's at. You know people don't want to possibly miss the further three or five percent potential, but they will completely ignore they could experience a ten percent drawdown with no geopolitical events. So I think raising cash is very smart. It doesn't take a genius to look at the overall economy and say, our global economy is not growing. <laughs> so you don't have to be an economist to see that. You know, and that's one of, the, that's one of the, the bullshit things that the industry and regulators have forced the public to believe is you guys aren't smart enough. You don't know enough. You don't have information. And I would say, well, that's completely wrong. Just go out to your grocery store and you tell me if inflation is still not in effect. Okay? Go, tell me when you lay your, dead, your head down at night, do you think about the world and say, wow, it's a pretty good place, things are growing? No. So you are smart enough. What you need to have is then that edification of the facts that back it up. So I would tell any average investor, hey, you know what's going on in your gut. You see it. So prepare for it. Not 100%, don't sell the entire portfolio, but hell, raise some cash in this environment. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds like very reasonable advice. Uh, it is interesting that over on Seven dot com, where uh, Luke and I are co lead advisors, there's a lot of folks in our community on the Discord channel that, since I've been uh, public about my newfound bear outfit, they're I think fully good faith counter argument is we don't get why you're so bearish. Look, uh, these are great businesses. They're making a massive amounts of money. There's AI, there's all this invention and sure things in the world are, are troubling in spots, but they've always been troubling in spots. And so why are you so damn bearish? And I'm, I'm saying this is kind of like a very reductive overgeneralized, uh, view but i don't i don't think these are people who are uh they're they're investors who have been investing for a long time i don't think they're what i would call forgive the the, the crudeness average uneducated uh americans so to speak yeah yeah I, I, but here's the thing though every investor has lived for the last 15 years in an environment where the market doesn't go down and people need to understand the market didn't go down because of the economy. The market went down because there was a structural change in the supply and demand relationship. Okay? There were arguably the same amount of stocks, but there were massive amounts of dollars chasing those stocks through stimulus. So I would argue that the average investor, some of them have not been in the market beyond 15 years when we had a a price discovery, a functioning market without stimulus, okay? And so they have never seen a market that is truly free trading. Um, and, and, and that's, there, there's evidence, look, you'll hear people say, well, my gosh, why is the VIX so low? Why is risk, the measure of risk so low in the market with all these geopolitical events? How is it that NVIDIA can continue to go up, right? How is it that my, uh, NVIDIA adds in a day, market capitalization equal to, you know, 40 of the other S&P stocks, all right? So they're seeing it, but what investors have been trained to do is just hold their nose and buy. We haven't experienced a significant drawn out downturn probably since 2000 and, I'd say 99 to 2000. We, we haven't seen, I mean, 2008, yes, but I'm saying where investors' portfolios were significantly impacted. We haven't seen that in a long time. So investors, the average investor is used to this, what I call the Fed put being in place, where the market's not allowed to go down. And people need to understand that that reason has everything to do with preventing a collapse. If a stock price goes down, the market capitalization of the company goes down, which would eventually affect their ability to borrow money, the ability to hit the capital markets, right? I mean, if your deck to equity ratio jumps up because your stock price has gone down, it's going to cost you more money to go out to the capital markets. And we haven't experienced that in a long time. It's been an easy money policy. So I think perception is going to be one of the most painful things that changes over the next two to three years. 
And I think that there's a whole swath of current people investing that are going to get wiped out. They, they will get wiped out because they have never experienced emotionally, psychologically down markets. It is absolutely brutal to wake up, look at your screen and see red day after day after day after week. And I don't think most investors today have any idea what that feels like. Okay, so on that note, <laughs> uh, let's hit maybe uh, one of the more unorthodox of your doomsday scenarios. Badger, wh wh what do you think I'm referring to? Yeah, this one caught my eye. Uh, I don't know if this is bullish or bearish, right? I suppose it depends on your science fiction tendencies. But uh, Mr. Not Advice, your seventh doom was <laughs> um, first disclosed contact with aliens. And you've got quotes around disclosed. Maybe you want to explain that too. Well, and I also have quotes around the aliens. I, I think it's not difficult to see that over the last three years, there's been a market change in communication from governments to the populace. In addition, the, the populace has uh, certainly is at a greater level of acceptance of the possibility of, of let's just say, uh, crafts and, 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 yeah, crafts that we can't explain. Um, the release and some of the Congress getting involved in the full disclosure of UAPs. Um, there seems to be an information free uh, front run going on as it has to deal with alien disclosure or relationships. Um, and, and I think that is a slow walk to general acceptance of a disclosure that, um, and I'm working primarily off of uh, former military and contractors not the Bob Lazars of the world, not the people who have been wearing tinfoil hats forever, but there seem to be a lot more credible people standing up saying, hey, look, I worked on them, or I saw them, or I know the government has them because I was involved in the project. I think that that disclosure could happen by the end of this year uh, where a government, and don't forget, we already have one government, uh, Mexico, who's paraded alien bodies, Right. And that's, you know, depending on the source has been debunked or not debunked. But there cer certainly seems the market change. If I would have said five years ago to you, hey, the U.S. Navy is going to come out and give offer video of objects they can't explain. You would have looked at me and said, you're out of your mind. And yet here we are. And I see that information disclosure, that pattern just increasing. It's speeding up. And so I think we're headed for a full disclosure event uh, I think that could actually be negative for the market uh, because I think it speaks to the foundations of our civilization. Um, we're, we're talking about the disclosure of communication slash relationship uh, with uh, an entity that is not of human origin, whether that's multidimensional, whether that's alien, whether that's spiritual, whatever it is, it's different than what you and I are made up of. Um, uh, Otherwise, in my thinking behind this, all of a sudden, there's been the, the faucet's been turned on in terms of free flow of information. Um, and let's not forget Donald Trump, very quietly, and Russia did the same thing. They all of a sudden announced a space force three years ago, right? And magically, we had a space force. Um, and so, look, I, I don't think aliens are trying to take over the world or the world is flat. I'm just following the trail, the breadcrumbs. Oh, my God. See, you tune in to Wall Street Wildlife, not just for Doomsday, but <laughs> Badger. Yeah, yeah. So, Badger, uh, uh, what, what do you, how do you respond to the alien um, semi-conspiracy? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. It's well, so out there. Yeah. Let's even, let's take the conspiracy bit out and just let's talk about, you know, when, the, when this happens or if this happens. Like, in some ways, you could proxy aliens for AI, right? We're, we're basically building the aliens right now. So if they don't come from outer space, like they're sitting on massive server farms run by NVIDIA uh, at some point, <laughs> and maybe that has the same impacts. I do wonder um, whether it could be positive in relation to like the last three dooms where we're in danger of blowing ourselves up uh, with Gaza, what's happening uh, you know, geopolitically, if, if we do determine that there's something non-human we have to deal with, 
kind of hopefully that's a unifying uh, force for us and we stop beating each other up. Um, right, you know, because how many times has that happened in U.S. history, in, in world history, where human beings took the positive choice and reacted positively? I mean, heck, cities can't even win that, you know, sports championships without their residents setting the city on fire. So, um, <laughs> well, well, actually, that's just such a tell, uh, Mr. Nadvice. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's how I know you're you're to some extent tied to Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, but well, yeah, but I don't want to be judged by that because we Philadelphians <laughs> we just have a more level-headed view of the world than most people do, and we acknowledge that most people are assholes, and we let them know that. So I don't want anything of what I'm saying to be you know jaded by where I come from. Uh, the, the, those Philly fans. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, look. I, I believe for, for, for those not in tune in the sports world, I believe Philadelphia sports fans, their number one uh, commandment is thou shalt throw batteries at the opposition. Yeah, and snowballs at Santa Claus. You know, people talk about that was on a Monday night game where they, the, the grounds crew forgot to take all the snow away and they'd snow. Well, look, my response is, yeah, we booed, so, snow, uh, we booed Santa Claus. But the reason why he got booed is because he fell down. When he came in on the parachute, he fell down. Hey, look, we Philadelphia fans expect excellence. If you're, if you're Santa Claus, you better know how to come in on a parachute. So, um, I, I, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, we're, I'm not going to apologize for who we are for speaking the truth on a daily basis uh, to, the, to, to the sports world. Oh dear. Okay, so I don't know. That sounds like a good note to wrap up. Wrap up on. Yes. Uh, you tune in to Wall Street Wildlife for investing insight, but what you come away with <laughs> is a more profound understanding of the world, how it works, and why Philadelphia sports fans are the barometer of excellence. Right. And if you, uh, if any of your listeners are Giants, Redskins. Um, Patriots or Arizona uh, fans, I, 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 I don't want to talk to them at all. And kids, if you're, uh, a Santa, if you're a Santa Claus fan, he doesn't need parachutes, don't worry. Right. If you're going to do a job, do it right. Otherwise, you're going to get hit by snowballs. I'm sorry. That's just the way life is. So this has been another uh, episode, but not just any other episode of Wall Street Wildlife. I am at seven flying put platypus on x my compatriot is at seven luke hallard on x you could find us on the youtubes at wall street uh wallstreetwildlife.com we are co-lead advisors at seveninvesting.com and none other than our resident vulture mr not advice uh you are on at Mr. Not Advice on X, and you also have a website, mrnotadvice.com, where you run a Discord channel for members interested in following your views on macro and short term investing. Correct. Thank you very much for having a great discussion today. Go Eagles. Thank you, All right. Take care, Mr. Not Advice. Okay, bye. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Not Advice. Cheery stuff as ever. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.